Revolution is going on now to restore liberty in this country is well on its way, and there's no way they're going to stop the momentum that we have started. And that is the victory that you have brought about because you have been the ones that have done the works. There's a lot of people here, but the ones across the countries, the donors and the excitement on the campuses, it's just unbelievable. We don't always get the coverage or the interest shown on what, what is going on because if they did, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't be ignoring so much of what we're doing. But you know, I find it sort of fascinating when they finally get around, and this is different people, it could be in the media, it could be our opponents or whatever, but I sort of have to chuckle when they describe you and me as being dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> That's one thing they are telling the truth, because we are dangerous to the status quo of this country. to the Federal Reserve System as well. Yes. And the Fed, right, and the Fed. In studying monetary history from the beginning of our country and even uh, throughout all of history, monetary policy on periodic occasions will come become the dominant issue. And we have emphasized that and it has become an important issue. Just think, this is the first presidential campaign that this subject ever came up since the Federal Reserve was started. So we are now... Because of what is happening, it will remain a dominant issue. There's no way they're going to put it to bed because they have destroyed our money. It's worldwide. There's a financial crisis going on, and it's only sound money and personal liberty that can solve the crisis that we have today. But the one, reason, the one reason I talk about the monetary system so much, it was a sneaky, deceitful way to pay the bills. You know, an honest government that wants to be uh, a big spending government would tax the people, and uh, then uh, the people would know what they were doing. If, if we had to pay taxes for everything that they do, uh, you know, the people would rise, rise up and, and stop it. So then they started borrowing money a lot, and then uh, people didn't notice that quite as much because they passed that on. But then they resorted to the printing of the money, and that is why the Federal Reserve was established, to take care of the powerful interests, the military industrial complex, the banking system, and deficit financing. And there's a couple reasons they have deficit financing. Sometimes there are conservatives that want deficit financing, and sometimes there are liberals that want deficit financing. And they have resorted, they have resorted to this, and of course this is why we are facing this crisis today. But it also serves those interests who like to think that we have this responsibility. They claim it's a moral responsibility to take our young people, put them into the military, and send them hither and yon around the world, policing the world, and using up the money. So just, uh, just as we have been able to bring to the forefront that most important issue of funny money, fiat money, the paper money system, the Federal Reserve, we have brought to the forefront. Others have tokenly talked about it. They get in office and they do nothing about it. But right now, it is this liberty movement which is seen as a patriotic movement, an individual liberty movement that is saying to the country and to the world, we've had enough of sending our kids and our money around the world to be the policemen of the world. It's the time to bring them home. The 
one thing is, is we, we do know they will come home. My goal and our goal has always been to bring them home in a deliberate fa fa uh, fashion to avoid a major economic crisis by de destroying our economy by spending so much overseas. In the last 10 years, the wars that have gone on added $4 trillion of debt. And I don't think we have been one bit safer for it. I think we have been less safe because of all the money that we have spent overseas. So this is the issue now. It is, it is an issue that I think is crucial. Uh, Jim mentioned in the introduction that, uh, uh, you know, so often they say that if we tell people that we think we should spend less in the military, they say, oh, that means you want to cut defense. No, if you cut the military industrial complex, you cut war profiteering, but you don't take one penny out of national defense. <laughs> And besides, besides, we're, we're flat out broke. Fortunately, we did not have to fight the Soviets. The Soviets brought themselves down for economic reasons. Do you know that they were so foolish and thought themselves so bold that they could pursue their world empire that they invaded Afghanistan? <laughs> But we will come home, but if we do it now calmly and deliberately, we can save our economy here at home. Because there are a lot of people who are suffering here at home. You have to stop the inflation because that's what destroys the middle class and that's what transfers the wealth from the poor and the middle class to the wealthy. And that is why the wealthy got their bailouts and the middle class shrunk and they lost their jobs and they lost their houses. So this is what we have to do. We have to cut the spending. This is why I have made a token suggestion in the first year at office we would cut at least one trillion dollars from the budget now the one thing that the, the talk you hear in Washington is pure talk because there is nobody suggesting the other candidates are not talking about real cuts. They're talking about cutting proposed increases out in 10 years. They say, oh, we'll cut a trillion dollars. Yeah, trillion dollars over a 10 year period, which is $100 billion every year. Our national debt is going up in real terms $100 billion every month. And they claim that's cutting and they're yelling and screaming, oh, we can't cut, we can't cut. We do have to cut. We have to live with in our means if we want to be able to at least take care of the people who have been made to be so dependent on the government. I mean, we have to work our way out. I would say if we did this and cut this overseas spending, at least we might be able to allow the Social Security beneficiaries to get their checks and medical care be provided. But if we continue to do what we're doing, the results are that the dollar is destroyed and the whole thing comes apart and it's going to be a worldwide phenomenon. Already, already Social Security beneficiaries are suffering a lot. Their income is shrinking because the value of the dollar is going down. So they're getting, they're getting their checks cut. And that is why you have to think about the cutting and the stopping the inflation. But overall, you have to ask once again, as our founders did, what should the role of government be in a free society? The role should be very simple, the protection of liberty. Constitution uh, was written for a very precise manner. It was not designed to restrain the individual, not to restrain you. It was to protect your liberties and to restrain the federal government. But liberty, liberty has to be re-emphasized because we have been careless over the last hundred years. We have taken liberty and chopped it up into pieces. Some people think liberty has to do with personal habits, which I agree. Other people think liberty is how to spend your money, and they defend that part, and then they fight about when to do what. I think what we need to do is make this emphasis that liberty means you have a right to your life and your privacy and the way you want to live your life as long as you don't hurt people and you have a right to keep and spend your money as you want to.
Freedom, freedom is a wonderful idea, and that's why I get so excited, but I really get excited when I see young people saying, it is a wonderful idea. Freedom is popular, don't you know that? Yeah. Now, Freedom brings people together. I think it's magnificent that the crowds that have come out over the weeks and months have been very diverse because it should be, because some people want their freedom to practice their religious in some one way, or maybe another way. Some might not even want to practice it at all. But freedom, if you understand it, you should all fight for freedom because you want to exert your freedom the way you want. Same way with economic freedom. It should bring people together. And I think this is one reason people worry about how are you ever going to put the coalition or how are you going to, oh, no, they don't want a coalition. They say, how are you going to compromise and give up some of your beliefs in order to get some things passed? You don't have to compromise. What you have to do is emphasize the coalitions that people want their freedoms for a different reason and bring them together. It's been America, it's been the greatest country ever, the most prosperous country ever, the largest middle class ever, but it's not that way today. Our middle class is shrinking, the country is getting poor, the wealth is apparent, is, um, is based on debt, the few who really hold the wealth, it's maldistribution because it shifts over due to the regulations that control a government. We have had too many people too long in the last hundred years thinking that it was beneficial more to be high, have high paid lobbyists to, to get them to uh, uh, find out what they can get from the government rather than us petitioning our government in a proper manner to petitioning our government and demanding our freedoms back again. And a lot of times they, they, give us, they give us trouble and they say, freedom, you people are just too selfish. All you want to do is have your freedom, you know, and, and uh, they, they, uh, they, they argue that that is the case. But the thing of it is, the people, the bleeding hearts, and I understand them and I recognize them and I believe most of them are well intended. But it doesn't work is the problem. All that good intentions of saying, we're gonna give everybody a free house and them no loans and then they can borrow against you know, the equity. And look what happened. It was a bubble, it burst and they lost their houses. So the, the humanitarian instincts are there across the board. What we have to convince them, if you are a true humanitarian, you have to fight and argue the case for free markets, sound money, property rights, contract rights, no use of force, and a sensible foreign policy so we don't waste our resources. Yeah. We're, we're, well, we're well on our way. We're well, we're well on our way. Uh, people have asked me what did I expect five, ten years ago. I had no idea. I always assumed that the best I could do is set a record. I didn't know you were out there. <laughs> But it's, it's no longer that irate, tireless minority that is stirring up the troops. Now that irate minority and so tireless as you have been, it's growing by leaps and bounds. It's going to continue to grow by leaps and bounds. And we will restore freedom to this country. Thank you very much. Congressman Ron Paul of Texas, projected by NBC News to be the second place finisher tonight in New Hampshire, uh, saying to his very, very enthusiastic and young supporters there, I didn't know you were out there, seeing just glee on the face of Ron Paul. You can tell from his speaking style, obviously no teleprompter tonight. He is not, he does not speak like a mainstream presidential candidate, but it is undeniable that Ron Paul has moved a lot of people who would not otherwise be interested in politics and who certainly would not otherwise be interested in Republican politics. He has been a catalyzing force for young people in this country that is outside the mainstream of Republican politics, but that is big enough now that he is placing a very very strong second to Mitt Romney in New Hampshire, and he placed a strong third in Iowa. Right now, let's go to Chris Matthews, who's in Manchester. Chris? You know, I was just wondering, Rachel, whether the appeal, this sort of the uh, strangely innocent appeal of this fellow who giggles about the idea of being called dangerous isn't the fact that largely his appeal is not to those who have joined the, or are part of the droppings, I might call them and have called them, of the Republican Party over the years, beginning with the segregationists to move over 
uh, from the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, beginning in the 60s after the passage of the Civil Rights Bill. The religious right, the ones who were theocrats who moved over after the passage of the uh, Supreme Court decision on public school prayer. The neocons who moved over when McGovern came in, the people like Gene Kirkpatrick, all those people moved in.